Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Evelyn with Gen Next Education and the International Knowledge Center. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are going to be talking today about the Common App versus University Applications. Uh, but first, given um, recent current events and um, the particularly the, the U.S. presidential elections, we've asked our presenter, Anna Weiss, to speak for a few minutes about that topic specifically. Um, and then we will get into the Common App versus the University App. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and um, do our quick introduction and then turn it over to Anna. So as many of you know, um, we are the Gen Next a US-based company that helps universities connect with students in India and in other places around the world. Uh, and then we have the International Knowledge Center, which is a Gen Next initiative based in Bangalore. But we also have staff right now in Mumbai and Chennai who are available to advise students on their study abroad opportunities free of cost. Um, why do we exist? We exist so that all the information, um, both the, the breadth and scope of it, some of it's um, good information, some of it's bad information, but our goal is to connect you back to the source, um, specifically the universities um, that you are applying to. So the webinar is a reflection of that. We bring in speakers from different universities, including our partner institutions. So we work with um, a lot of universities, but we have universities that have committed a little bit um, more on a long-term basis to work with us and the students that we know and work with. Um, and so today we are very happy to have join us Anna Weiss from the University of Delaware. Anna has nearly seven years experience in international higher education and she is currently the Assistant Director of Admissions International at the University of Delaware, which incidentally is where um, Vice President Joe Biden went to school. And with that, I am going to turn the presentation over to Anna. Anna, thank you so much for joining us and I will, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Evelyn. Um, so thank you everybody for tuning in on this Saturday evening. We appreciate that. Um, so today we are going to be talking about the common application versus a university's uh, separate application. But as Evelyn said, in light of recent events, we are going to take a little bit of time at the beginning just to um, discuss possible implications and really try and settle a few fears, possibly, hopefully, on post-US election. So the first thing that I think is very, very important to stress is that it's really too early for us to say anything definitively. And the reason I say that is um, I'll get into a lot of different reasons, um, ways that the US has checks and balances in place in order to ensure that one person never has too much power. But also, if we look at the specific person that was elected, so Donald Trump has run on a campaign that is quite frequently full of contradictions. So even if we were to say such and such is going to happen or such and such is going to be canceled, changed, it's very, very hard for us to say anything with any kind of confidence because um, of course, once you run your campaign and versus the way you run your country, um, with a normal candidate, those two things will be different. But for this specific candidate, it's even harder to speak to his motivations because he has quite frequently contradicted himself over the course of the campaign. Now that said, I mentioned the U.S. being a country of checks and balances. So when this country was first formed, it was designed with the Constitution with three separate um, branches of the government, the 
executive, which is, of course, the president, the legislative, and the judicial section, which means that in order for real change to happen, particularly anything that would affect any type of constitutional rights, those types of changes take a very long time and are very, very hard to implement. And they must be passed by all three branches, which is, a, as you can imagine, a very difficult thing. So it should be a little reassuring in that even if one person, the president, has a certain agenda, he still has to pass through all of these systems of checks and balances, which means that it will take a very long time for any major changes to be approved if he can get them through these other branches. And over the course of the campaign, um, other politicians, senators, congressmen, judges, people across the country have spoken out against policies that Donald Trump has suggested that would be anti-immigrant, anti a lot of these things we're reading about on the internet. So it's really reassuring to realize that one person cannot implement all of these changes all on his own, as the U.S. is not a dictatorship. He's a president, and he has to work with the rest of the government. So that's another reason, again, that it's very, very hard for us to say anything concretely right now, because he himself does not get to implement every rule that he wants. Now, the other thing I want to stipulate is there's a lot of... Um, a lot of people are understandably concerned um, about how does Trump feel about immigrants? Is he going to cut down on immigrants coming to the U.S.? And there are two things that I think it's important for us to talk about, specifically in dealing with Indian immigrants. Um, the first is Donald Trump has run most of his campaign based on keeping illegal immigrants out of the country. Now, international students who come to study are very much legal immigrants, and there's a lot of paperwork that goes with that. Everybody knows about the visa process and the application process. So uh, any legislation that he implements in order to cut down on legal immigrants should really not apply in terms of Indian international students applying for an F1, which is a student, or a J1, which is a visiting student or scholar visa. Um, the other thing is that Donald Trump has actually spoken out in support of the Indian community, Indian students, and Indian culture over the course of his campaign. So even if we were, and we are, sometimes concerned about some types of immigration reform, he has only ever really um, encouraged Indian immigration and is a big fan of um, the idea of increasing Indian immigration has been what he has said. Now, the other thing I think that's important to talk about is the response from the majority of Americans. Now, um, it is scary when something like this happens, and it is easy to assume, oh, this means Americans, Americans may not be as welcoming to immigrants. But the response post-election has really been overwhelmingly overwhelmingly um, pro-diverse -di culture, people saying this president, these statements that he has said do not represent me, do not represent my family, and are, um, are not representative of the society that I believe in. Now this increases even more so if you look at which counties and which areas in the U.S. voted for Donald Trump you'll notice that the areas that did not vote for Donald Trump overwhelmingly are those surrounding universities. And the reason for that is when you attend a university, you are surrounded by students who are different than yourself, students from different backgrounds, different races, different religions, different identities. And when you learn from, from and alongside people who are different than yourself, it breeds empathy. And these empathetic people um, it's very hard to vote with any type of, for any type of possible legislation that would affect people who are different than you. Now, it's an easy question to say, okay, so then why did Trump win the presidency if there are all these people who are against him? Now, that's a big, very, a very complicated question. 
you can Google the Electoral College of the U.S. and come to your own conclusions. I won't speak too much to that, but you should be aware that if you look online at locations and people who have voted for and against Trump, you'll see overwhelmingly those places with universities, cities with universities, overwhelmingly voted against Trump. And a lot of that has to do with the exchange of ideas and the value of diversity on U.S. campuses. And this can really just go to reassure you some that in U.S. campus environments and U.S. campus communities, um, our students, our professors, our faculty members, our um, presidents and vice presidents of the universities, chancellors, are very, very much embracing of students from different backgrounds and different cultural heritage because a lot of our learning happens not only in classrooms but also on our campuses with interactions between students from different backgrounds and, um, so, and having different types of social norms that they bring to the table. So that said, I do want to say um, one more thing about it which is how my particular university has reacted. So I work for the University of Delaware, which is one of the oldest universities in the US. It was the sixth university. It was founded in 1743, so we've been around for over 250 years um, since the election, um, which, by the way, the state that we're located in, as well as our community, overwhelmingly voted against Donald Trump. Our president has actually come out and addressed the blue hen, which is our mascot, addressed our community, reminding us that our university is built on five key strategic goals, which you can look online and you can verify what I'm saying. Five key strategic goals, one of which is multiculturalism and diversity. So valuing students from around the world, around the country, and creating a safe environment for all students to learn and grow from each other. I do want to read, from, read to you a really quick excerpt from a letter which the University of Delaware president, president um, Dennis Asanis, and the Vice Pres Provost for Diversity released, which says, um, this was released on November 10th, 2016, um, diversity of opinions and beliefs is paramount to any inclusive community and we strive to give voice to those myriad viewpoints in a respectful manner while also emphasizing our stance on diversity and inclusion. Irrespective of your background, we believe that diversity, including diverse perspectives, strengthen us as a whole. We want to reassure our community members that we value each and every one of you. As Blue Hens, now is another opportunity to reaffirm our commitment to building a nurturing, inclusive, and diverse community. So. The last thing I want to say about that, and I don't know, I guess we may have one or two minutes for quick questions, or perhaps we should save those for the end, is that, as I said at the beginning, it can be tempting to give in to fear and rumors and speculation, but because of the nature of the U.S. government system, because of the nature of the specific candidate's campaign, because of the backlash from Americans saying, this does not represent my belief, it is really too early to say anything with any kind of confidence about what will happen. And speculation can really just run rampant and make things a lot more frightening than they actually will be. So that said, I believe I'm going to change over because it looks like we've spent about 15 minutes talking about that. Uh, we will have a little bit of time for questions at the end, and we can talk about questions at the end relating to Trump as well. Um, but we're going to talk about the common application, which was the goal of this session. Okay, so show my screen. Um, can we see my screen? Evelyn, can you let me know? Yes, I can see yeah. your screen. So I'm going okay. to assume that everyone else can as well. Okay, so um, right now we're looking at the website, which we are excited right now because our women's field hockey team is going to the national championship. So that's what you see there. They're going to the national championship on Sunday. So if you're interested in field hockey, Delaware is um, the, going to the top game right now. But what we're going to focus on is here in the upper right-hand corner, which is the apply section. We're going to click on apply. So how do we apply? 
we're going to leave it here for a second. So I want to talk about um, various application types. So we're here to talk today about the common application versus um, unique applications for specific schools. Now, the University of Delaware, we only use the common application. And the reason that we decided to do that, first of all, is the common application, since it is one application that can be used for hundreds of institutions, it allows ease of access for students. So it makes it easier for students to apply to us and gives us a stronger applicant pool. Now the other thing it does is the common application is run by a very savvy team of technical engineers, writers, people who are monitoring this system, which means that if we want to update our application and um, ask for any additional requirements or incorporate any additional types of um, video blogs or online resumes, for instance, the University of Delaware has recently started working with Zimi, which is an online resume service. If we want to implement any changes on a large scale, um, we can work with those um, computer designers and those engineers who are working for the common application and are, have a lot more technical skills than some of the people that we are working with. So that allows us to work with the common application. And the other thing is it gives us a very easy method of collecting and monitoring applications. So it keeps everything streamlined, gives us easier access for a variety of students, and it means that if we want to implement changes, we don't have to try and do it on our own. Now, the reason for having a personal application, which again, University of Delaware does not, but there are other schools, and I have worked for a previous institution that used a personal application. The reasons for these are quite simple. Oftentimes, it is less expensive. Um, in order to use the common application, a university must agree to pay a certain amount per year to have them help run the application for the university. There's a fee associated with that. So if you use your own application, the university does not need to pay that fee. The other thing is um, the common application, as you will see once you go through the, a little bit as we go through it today, but once you work on your own common application, you will definitely see it is quite comprehensive and it can take a long time to fill it out and there's a lot of information on there. For instance, at one point it will ask you, what is your parents' educational background? And there are some universities who will say quite simply, you know, that's not going to affect our admissions decision. What is your parents' educational background? So we don't really need that information. So if the school wants to simplify the application process, they can write their own application that includes only exactly the information that they need to make their admissions decision. So um, reasons for having your own application um, on the university side can be that it is less expensive and it is also able to be simplified just down to the information that they absolutely need. So we're going to keep moving through because we are on a little bit of a time crunch and we're going to talk a little bit about filling out the application and I'm going to be working on some applications here for you as part of the webinar. Okay, so um, as you remember we were on the University of Delaware website we're going to be using, of course, the University of Delaware application because that's what I have the most access to. We hit the upper corner with Apply, and now it brings us to this page, Dare to be First, which is our slogan. We're going to focus on undergraduate admissions for today, um, and we're going to hit the Learn More button. Um, Learn More button takes us to this page here, which says Apply Now. We're going to click on that. Now this is going to take us to the Common Application website. So you can see this is the specific University of Delaware section on the Common Application. Now if you look, it tells us, um, it tells us some about where is the school located. So we're in the Mid-Atlantic region. So it's a very good way for you to see U.S. is of course a big country. Which location do you want to go to? It also has address, it has our admissions office, email, this is the traditional admissions office email, and the phone number tells you what type of university. We're public four-year co-ed and now it says ready to apply. It's the University of Delaware. We're going to say add to my colleges. So when you're filling out the common application, you're filling out one application which is applicable 
to a variety of universities. It's over, it's several hundred universities that accept the common application. Now, I'm going to create a new account really quickly just to show you how that process looks because there are a couple questions it asks you initially that are important that we get correct. So you'll see, I started over here. I do have an account that we're going to work with later that I've worked on a little bit already. It's this one over here. But we're going to hit, don't have an account, create an account. Okay, so now in the common application, we're going to start by saying, I am a student, right? And we're going to go to the next, continue. Um, we're going to use an email address. So we're going to say, Anna TC. Oh, this is a personal email address of mine. Please don't spam me. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start our account. And that one's already used because I've been playing around with this. Hang on. No difference. I'm sorry. Okay, so we're going to use my name, Anna. This is my maiden name, Kane. We're going to fill out information here. Um, actually, really, all I want to do is I want to show you this page. So we're not going to fill it out really quickly. I want to talk about these sections. So you're going to say your first name, your last name, you're going to write your address. And you will see that you can enter in um, foreign addresses. So an Indian address, for instance, in Bangalore will not be an issue. They're going to ask you about gender, they're going to ask you about phone numbers, and you can, collect, you can select different countries' codes here as well. Date of birth. Now the thing I want to talk about specifically is here. This section is important, so if you're applying as a first-year student, it's very important that you hit that button over there because the application that will be generated by the Common App is going to be different if you hit first year versus if you hit transfer. So it's important that you pick the right section. This is a mistake that students will make frequently. Now the next, tell us about your plans. When do you plan to start college? So we're going to hit 2016-2017. That's going to be um, most likely the most common decision for you. Now if you want to apply early, if you're in year 10 or you're in year 11, you can actually start working on your Common App now, which for me that seems too early. But the option is here. Um, now let's talk a little bit about these sections. So over here it says um, basically do you want the colleges that you're applying to, so when you select which colleges are you applying to, do you want them to be able to contact you? And do you want the Common Application to be able to contact you? Now, these are optional. You can um, deselect them. My advice is at least select the top one um, because if you've already decided the school is interesting enough to you that you want to fill out their application, then really you want any type of communication they can give you because you can find out about interesting scholarship opportunities, find out about deadlines, find out about a variety of useful information if you check this button. So my advice is definitely at least select this one. Now over here, these are, um, these are things that you will have to select in order to continue on, and that's just privacy, things like that. Okay, so we're going to move on now to the application that I have started already. Okay, so welcome Anna. Okay, so University of Delaware already exists in my colleges list because I've already added it, right? So now if you look at my dashboard, which is our main page in Common Application, it says my colleges, right now I have University of Delaware. If I hit the arrow down, it tells me what type of, what type of um, documents and what types of parts of the application I still need to work on. Now the common application does vary slightly, university by university. Right now we're just looking at University of Delaware, but let's see what happens when we add another university. So we're going to go to College Search. So let's start with one that everybody's heard of. We'll hit Harvard. And try and search by Harvard, right? So you have Harvard College in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So I'm going to add this now to my um, list of colleges. So now if you go to my colleges here, which is our second tab, this has Harvard College, which is um, here and it tells me exactly what types of requirements Harvard has to complete the application. 
Now here you'll see University of Delaware. So I can open it here and see again exactly what requirements um, the University of Delaware has versus Harvard. Now you'll see um, questions, recommenders, FERPA, review and submit common app on Harvard. You'll see University of Delaware, the same three sections. So right now they're not checked off because I have not completed um, I have not completed these sections in my application, but when I fill it out one time, um, that will work for both universities since they're the same requirements. Now where this can vary is down here to writing supplements. Now as part of your common application, there will be an essay component that every single student who fills out the, right, the common application will have to fill out. And I will show you that in just a minute. Um, but some universities will have additional requirements or additional things you can fill out. For instance, University of Delaware has a, um, has a writing supplement, which is optional. So if you want to, you can fill out additional questions telling us why are you interested in University of Delaware, um, telling us more personal stories about yourself and how do you see yourself as a University of Delaware student. And Harvard, on the other hand, they have a writing supplement um, which I do not believe is optional. So University of Delaware, the supplement is optional. Harvard, it is not. So if you apply to six or seven universities, you will see them all here down in the My Colleges list. But you can check um, every time Anna, what is missing. I'm sorry, yeah. I don't usually interrupt, but um, I think it might be helpful at this point to interrupt about the writing supplement. You said that it's optional for the University of Delaware. Can you talk a little bit more about when you would want to see that, why you would want to see that? Should students, I think um, the students we work with might feel like they just should do it anyway. Um, what are your feelings on that? Um, if honestly, in my opinion, is if it's a university that you're interested in, anytime you see the word supplement, like you can, an optional supplement, see, you can see here writing supplement is optional, um, I would fill it out because it tells the university that you're willing to spend a little bit more effort to, um, to complete the application and to show the university that you're passionate about it. Now, when does this come into play? The supplement can oftentimes tell us whether you're applying to the university specifically for a reason, whether because there's a faculty member that's there, whether because of our location, proximity to Philadelphia, New York, Washington, DC, or whether with, with this common application form, you remember you can actually apply to more than one university. Right now we only have two, but you can apply to up to 20 universities. So when universities are looking at applications, they're assuming you're applying to um, at to up to 20 universities, likely somewhere between 5 and 20. So if you want to tell the university that you're specifically interested in this, this university, filling out this supplement that is optional is a good way to do that. Now how often is it going to affect the admissions decision? It will affect the admissions decision more frequently if you are applying for a very competitive major. For instance, my university has um, a top 10 nationally ranked chemical engineering program, which is very competitive to get admission to because we are ranked amongst the top 10 universities in the US for that program. So um, if I have two students who have a very similar type of um, academic background, have those very similar types of credentials, and would both be successful students or have the potential to be successful students, but I can only admit one because of space capacity issues, then I may look to the writing supplement. Oh, one student put in effort and has shown that he has researched the um, professors teaching in our chemical engineering department and is obviously more invested in our school than a student who doesn't fill it out. So my advice is, if you are interested and invested, particularly in the university that's your top choice, even if they have something optional, I would still fill it out. That is again, that is really my opinion as an admissions professional. I do, I do note whether students fill out this writing um, supplement when I am reviewing applications. That is something I pay attention to. But every university has a slightly different admissions process, so I can't speak in general. But my advice is, if you're interested in a university, 
anything that they ask for, you want to give them as much information as you can, as long as it's all applicable. Okay, um, so we've, we can see here all of the requirements. It talks about school report, counselor recommendation. We're going to talk about recommendation letters in just a minute. Um, University of Delaware is a little unique, so we're going to write here that we need a counselor recommendation and we need a teacher evaluation. Both of these are recommendations, but they need to come from a principal or a counselor in this, in this instance, and one from a teacher. So sometimes you have to make sure that universities, um, when you're writing, when you're having recommendation letters written, that they're coming from the right sources. And this is a unique thing about University of Delaware. But again, if you look at Harvard, Harvard is going to tell you all the information again that you need. So Harvard is different. They need a counselor recommendation here and two teacher recommendations. But the nice thing about this page with my colleges is everything is clearly written out. It also will tell you um, different types of application deadlines here. So Harvard has an early action deadline and they have a regular decision. Whereas if you go to University of Delaware, we only have regular decision. So we do not do early action or early decision. This will answer any types of questions, deadlines, any of that type of questions that you have. It also tells you application fee, tells you test policy. So University of Delaware, for instance, we are SAT, ACT optional for international students and for Delaware state residents. So that is why we have a flexible policy here. But I want to move on in the interest of time um, and go to the common application. So this is that application that, as I mentioned, is going to be sent to all the universities that you're applying to. So you can see profile is going to be the first section. It tells you everything you need to fill out here. So if we go down, we have personal information, um, and I've just begun filling that out. It's not my actual birth date. I just began filling information out. Um, personal information here, address, contact information. We'll go through. Um, so an address, a made-up address in Bangalore, just to show you that you can use um, an Indian address. It's not a problem. Um, you can see contact details where again they're going to ask you for phone numbers and you can select Indian plus 91. Um, demographics, um, they're going to ask you just a little bit about demographics and that helps them run reports to make sure that the application is um, usable and fair for students from a variety of areas. Um, geography, language, citizenship. Now this is one I want to touch on. So this is an important thing that um, we need to be able to talk about in order to have you submit your application properly. So when you fill, select your citizenship status, you're going to choose, most likely, other non-US here. List of citizenships. So we're going to say India. Do you currently hold a valid US visa? No. If you intend to apply for a different US visa, please indicate that visa type. Okay, so what this does is when you submit your application, it tells the university, are you an international student? So if you submit this information correctly, when we process your application, we will, um, we will change the application requirements just to say that you would not have to submit an SAT or an ACT. As I said, that's optional for international students, not optional for US citizens. We will also require a TOEFL or an IELTS and it will let us know that you may require visa counseling and you'll require an I-20 eventually in order to come to the university. So it is very important that you fill out this section, you fill it out properly. Otherwise, your application will not be able to be processed correctly. Okay, so we're going to go down here. We're going to say, um, you can see that we can select a variety of different types of visas. We're going to go for F1, which is your student visa. And I believe this will be the most common visa type that will be applicable. We'll say continue. Okay, so scholarship information, you want to find out about scholarships and financial aid, you can say yes, no. Common app fee waiver is um, the common application, if you remember from our My Colleges page, University of Delaware has a $75 application fee. So some students who have low financial ability will apply for a fee waiver, and that's how you do that through this page here. Now, <coughs> if we go down to education here, I want to talk about this. Because this allows you to move on to the next step of your application. So, 
education. The, and this is very important because this tells a university what is your educational background. Have you attended a university in India where we might want to try and um, get you transfer credits? For instance, if you have spent a year at University of Delhi, um, we're going to want to make sure that we can get you as much transfer credit as possible. So you want to put down your current or most recent school. Um, let's assume that we have a student who is attending Delhi Public School. Right? I know we have some locations in Bangalore. So we said that I lived in Bangalore. Okay, to continue. So now this is selected uh, school in India. We put it there. Now we're going to say date of in entry. So um, say we're going to put September of the year 2013. Is this a boarding school? No. Um, did or will you graduate from the school? Yes. I'm making things up here. You'll have to, of course, change this to um, what is applicable for you. Okay. So now we're going to say counselor. If I put in Gurish as the counselor, just in order to fill it out. Um, so we're going to say Gurish at my ikc.com and continue. Okay, so now if you've attended any other schools, please indicate. So this is important because when we look to complete your application, if you started your high school, your secondary school at one, one school and then transferred, we need to make sure that the transcripts that you send us match up with your educational history. So it is important that you put your school information here. Now, as you go down, you will see there's a place to add community-based organizations, education interruption. This means if you took a year off after um, you finished high school, maybe you traveled, maybe you got a job, um, you can tell us why and what types of education interruptions you, can, you had. Colleges or universities, so this tells us um, have you taken any university courses. And again, we use this to decide whether you would be able to qualify for transfer credits. Grades. Now this is a section where you can tell us um, your academic profile, a little bit about your grades. Now realize, when you fill this out, you can put whatever you want here. So a university will look at it quickly, but you have to verify that your GPA, if you tell us that you received a 99 in your, in your overall cumulative grades, we're going to need to see that 99 on your mark sheet, sheets and on your year 10 and 12 results as well. So we're not just going to look at your grades and believe you. Because <laughs> I can put, you know, that I have a 100 and that I got into all the IITs and all this information. But it needs to be verified by your official documentation. Okay. Honors. So this tells us, did you win any awards? Future plans. Do you want to be an accountant? Do you want to be an artist? What types of plans do you have? Okay. There's, you can see here on the common application, we have sections on testing, where again, you can tell us, have you taken an IELTS score? What did you score? And again, this section is very self-reported, which means a university is not going to take just what you write here and assume, okay, so this student says they got a 110 on the TOEFL score, which is a test of English proficiency. Um, they're going to need to see an official TOEFL score that verifies this because you can put whatever you want, right? So you could say, okay, I took the, um, I took the TOEFL and I scored, um, I scored 110 if I wanted to. But it needs to be verified with your official documentation. Activities. Um, this talks about um, activities that you've been involved in. Do you volunteer? Do you work in theater? Do you play football? Do you join the Model UN? This tells the university about, your, about you. And it is tempting to fill up every single slot that they give you. Um, but my advice is only tell the university about things that are truly important to you. So if you are very passionate about playing football, if you're very passionate about Model UN, definitely tell us about it. But do not feel like the more things you list here, the better. Because if you list, oh, I spent one week when I was in year nine um, volunteering with students because I was off of school and I had time, so I 
worked with elementary students for one week. Okay, that doesn't tell me very much about you specifically. So this should be used just to tell us, okay, this student is really, really passionate about debate. So they're going to talk about their experience in debate club. They're going to talk about their experience in Model UN. These are things that are important to you. Now the writing section. This is what I talked about. So personal essay. This is part of your common application. And you can see a list of schools that you've applied, to, that you are applying to. So <coughs> for both Harvard and for University of Delaware, we require an essay, this essay section to be filled out. It is possible that you will apply to a school and it will not be required. If that's the case, the school will be here. So remember, you're applying to multiple universities, multiple schools, and each one will use this common application slightly differently. So for both Harvard and University of Delaware, they require this personal essay. So if you look here, um, it tells, us, tells you why. So this demonstrates your ability to write clearly and concisely on a selected topic. So the application will not ex accept a response shorter than 250 words, and 650 words is your maximum. So this is your college essay that everybody freaks out about and talks about. Really, what's important is, remember, you have all these different topics you can choose from. To us, it's irrelevant which one you select. You choose which one applies best to you. And use it as an example of something about you that you want me or whoever's reviewing your application at Harvard to know when we look at your application. Don't worry so much about writing some great novel or something that would be worthy of a Pulitzer Prize. This is about you connecting with me and telling me something about you. Tell me about a problem that you've solved and a story, something that tells me about how you think and how you operate. And it does not, I can't stress this enough, Sometimes I'll read applications that will start off with like, oh, it was a moonlit night and the wind blew through the trees as I stood on the lake on the precipice of decision. All these dramatic things like, that is not going to help me make an admissions decision. The essay tells me something about you clearly that I cannot see from your grade 9, 10, 11 results. So pick a question that applies to you. Don't overthink it. Use it as a way to tell me something interesting about you, what makes you passionate. Okay, so here's where you're going to enter the essay, you're going to continue. Okay, now I'm going to go back to um, my colleges really quickly because I want to talk about one other thing which is this section here, recommenders and FERPA. Okay, so FERPA, this is another thing that a lot of students will have an error in. So I want to talk really quickly about what this is. The FERPA is an official form. It is a non-disclosure form. So when you're filling out your application, you're going to click here, and it tells you how does FERPA relate. So when you're asking for recommendation letters from principals, from counselors, um, they want to know that they can send the letters in privacy. Because if you're going to be reviewing them first, it can sometimes affect what they say. So if you fill out this FERPA form, you can promise to them this letter will be given anonymously and um, they'll be able to write more honest letters which will have more um, weight and more value to admissions counselors. Now the other thing FERPA does is it will come with you to the university. So when you actually end up attending university, you will need to have a FERPA form which tells which tells us about your security wishes. So when you come to university, you will be 18 or older, and you will be responsible for your own academic, um, academic reports, which means if you fill out a FERPA and you say, I'm not going to allow anybody else to see my academic reports, even if your mom, your dad, your cousin, anybody asks to see what types of grades you have, you filled out a FERPA that says nobody is allowed to see it, they will not be able to see it. So you can fill out, you can adjust your FERPA later on and say, okay, my mother is allowed to see what types of grades I have achieved. And oftentimes your parents might say, okay, I'm applying, I'm going to be paying for your university, so I want to be able to see. 
So FERPA is going to follow you there, and it really has to do with who can see what. And since you will be an 18-year-old student, at when you start university, or at least soon after you start university, this is your decision about who gets to see what. Okay, so we're going to say, I have fully read and understand FERPA release form, and you do have to do this in order to complete. You have to say, I have read all of this, and I understand. Now, the second it says, I authorize every school that I have attended to release all requested records and recommendations to colleges in which I am applying for admission. I also authorize employees at these colleges to confidentially contact my current and former schools should they have questions about the information submitted on my behalf. And again, you have to fill that out. Now, here's where you have the choice. You can say, I waive my right to review all recommendations and supporting documents. Or you can say, I do not um, waive my right. So this is with your letters of recommendation. You're saying, I don't have to see it, or I do want to be able to see it. And this can affect um, how universities see you. They're going to want to, it's really a much better idea to select the top one, because if you select the second one, now the university is concerned, why is it the student thinks they have to be able to review letters that come from teachers, that come from counselors? What are they nervous about? This gives your counselors, your teachers, the trust that, okay, they can write letters and submit them to universities, and you do not have to be able to review them. So this is important. I understand that my waiver, or no waiver selection above, pertains to all colleges. So every college that you apply to on the common application, any college you attend, um, is, this will apply to. And it cannot be changed after any recommendation or application submission. And you have to say that. We're going to say Anna applies, and this is the date. Save. Now you can see um, FERPA has been completed. And that's going to be something you will have to do in order to submit your application. Now we're going to do one more thing, and then we're going to open up for questions. Um, which is inviting a counselor. How do you invite a counselor? So, here, again, we're at our my colleges. We've filled out the FERPA. Um, and over here, we have recommenders for Harvard College. So you see what Harvard requires. They require a counselor, and they require teachers. They actually need two of them, right? Okay, so you're going to say, invite a teacher. Teacher. And you're going to say, okay, this is my math teacher. And we're going to just say, me again, right? Okay, add recommender. So, as soon as you hit this button, this is important. Um, this person, now me, is going to receive an email in their inbox saying that you have requested for them to be a recommender for them. Now. It is important to talk to your teacher, talk to your counselor before you put them down to ask, are they comfortable to be a recommendation for you? Because if you put a teacher down as a recommendation and they're not comfortable, that can reflect negatively on any kind of essay or a letter that they would write on your behalf. So you want to make sure that they know you're going to put them down as a recommender first and that they're okay with that and they've agreed to write you a letter. The other thing you want to do is realize as soon as you hit that button, even if your application is not officially submitted yet, this email is going out. So I will have an email in my personal inbox that says that this fake account that I've created is requesting a letter of recommendation. Okay, so, and now you see here um, the teacher, me, Anna Wise, math teacher, is selected there. Okay, so all of these different sections, you can select down here. You can see very simply what still needs to be submitted. This is considered incomplete, even though we did FERPA, because we only did one recommender, and remember, Harvard requires three. But it will tell you all the sections that need to be completed to help you know, where am I in this application process? How do I submit it? And at any time, you can, uh, until the university's deadline, you can add other universities through this section. Now there is a new area that has been added, which is financial aid resources over here. Um, I would, the one thing I have to say about this is financial aid oftentimes 
is from the US government and it is for US citizens because it comes out of taxes. So financial aid resources are really a lot more applicable to US citizens or permanent residents, although there are some universities that will offer financial aid, which is need-based aid. Um, but generally those are universities with a very, very with a lot of money and a lot of history. So for instance, Harvard, if you're admitted to Harvard, they offer financial aid for international students. But the majority of universities do not. So just keep that in mind with the financial aid resources. It's really a lot more applicable for domestic students and for permanent residents. Now that said, um, that concludes the um, presentation that I've prepared. So I think we have a little bit of time now, a few minutes, for question and answers. Um, Evelyn, do you think you can help us with that? Uh, thank you so much, Anna. And I'm going to take back the presentation. <coughs> and I also had the University of Delaware pulled up. Um, I'm going to go back in here. So at this point, yes, we have time for a couple of questions. And then here also is our contact information if you want to sign up for advising. Uh, again, it's completely free to students and parents. Uh, and then if you want to get in touch with Anna directly to ask a question about um, this webinar or to ask a question about applying to the University of Delaware or just anything in general about applying to the US I'm sure she would be happy to to answer those questions there's her contact information including um, how to get a hold of her on WhatsApp and then the link to the University of Delaware um, application information but yes at this time let's take a couple of questions and we had one um, that was added to the chat actually by our advisor, the IKC. Um, she's asking if you could explain um, how, how do we answer the currently hold a visa if I currently have a tourist visa for the US. And actually, Anna, I have seen this question come up as well. So a student will be confused about which visa status um, they're going to be on, can they apply if they're on a B visa, a tourist visa? Um, so can you address that? Uh, sure, absolutely. Okay, um, so let's see. Um, coming up. Um, so we're going to go to, I guess this is in, I'm trying to remember exactly where I was at. Okay, so do you currently hold a, a U.S. visa? We're going to go to edit. Um, so if I want, I can say, remember, this is, a, this is the important part about it. It says, do you currently hold? So oftentimes students will say, I had a B visa two years ago as I was traveling and I was a tourist. It's no longer applicable. So in that situation, you would say no. But if you have a current visa, you will select B2 tourist. And you'll put your visa number in, date issued, everything that you can verify to ensure that it is still, um, it is still, I'm sorry, I don't think I was sharing my screen. Okay, so over here, um, to ensure that it is still viable. Now, if you have a tourist visa, you can apply for an F1 visa. You have a few other, you have a few options. The best option is really to go back to India and apply initially for an F1 visa and not apply to change from tourist to F1. Um, but that will really come down to your university's visa advising office. So the fact that you have a B2 tourist visa will not mean you cannot apply for this F1 student visa. Um, it just tells the university, okay, this is the, the student's history of traveling through the US. So it should not be an issue. It's really just to make sure that if you have a previous student visa and you put this in, um, that changes our immigration process a little bit because if you have an F1 student visa at another university, now instead of issuing you a um, new I-20 to get a new visa, now we have to process a transfer from your I-20 and your visa from the other university. And honestly, this is this gets a little bit more complicated than I want to talk about right now because um, sure. we're getting into visa information. The thing to realize is 
put down, like, be honest in this section. If you have a B2 visa, if you have an F1 visa, put it down and be assured, be reassured that the university has a full staff in place who can help you with visa questions. But you have to fill this information out um, correctly and so that we can give you the proper response. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, and then quickly, we do have um, one other student question um, that is a two-part question. So the first one is, should we enter our 10th grade GPA or 12th grade? Um, I would say you want to do, uh, by the time you're applying to university in the U.S., it's a different type of application timeline. In India, usually you wait until after your grade 12 results, exam results come out, and then you apply to university. In the U.S., you're applying earlier than that. So you're applying in between, um, usually between October and January of your year 12 is when you have to submit your application. So by that time, your year 12 results are not ready. So you can put your year 10, you could even put a cumulative average of your overall mark sheets, although we understand how in India mark sheets go up 9, 10, and then down 11, and up 12, so that's understandable. Realize again, this is all self-reported information, so whatever you put there, we're still going to be reviewing your transcripts, we're still going to be reviewing your mark sheets, those are, and your year 10 results. Um, so. Okay. You can well, let whatever. me um, yeah. quickly just um, get to the other part of the question, and then we will um, be out of time, unfortunately, for other questions. Um, but again, you do have our contact information in order to reach out and get um, the rest of your questions answered. Um, so this student is currently in class 11. Um, they write, I will graduate uh, in the month of March of next year. I intend to do my studies in the U.S. right after the 12th, i.e. for bachelor's. When should I start preparing for SAT and applying at various universities? Okay, um, you will have the option to take the SAT really any time from now through um, probably November of your year 12 results. So the end of year 11, so any time from January of year 11 through December of year 12 is really when you want to be preparing your exams, preparing your common application, preparing your essay, and working on all that information with the assumption that the majority of U.S. universities, their deadline, their traditional deadline is going to be around January 15th. Now that said, I think it's very important for you as a year 11 student, particularly if you know that you want to attend university right after year 12, um, working with um, the IKC team because they can really help you um, navigate that system. They can help you select which universities you want to apply for, help you pay attention to deadlines, give you advice for when to take exams. But if you are in year 11 right now, I would say you want, and I would say you want to be studying for these SAT or these TOEFL scores um, now, and thinking about taking it sometime, maybe in April or May of next year. That also gives you the ability to take the exam again if you need to take the exam twice, um, particularly with an SAT or an ACT exam. Um, you can take the exam more than once and receive different scores and they will take the highest scores that you receive so it can oftentimes benefit you to be able to take the exam twice but my best advice is work with the IKC team and they can um, help you through that process. Anna, thank you so much. Um, we are out of time folks so uh, the last thing I just want to remind everyone is that Next week is Thanksgiving here in the U.S., so we will not have a webinar, 
But our next webinar is scheduled for December 3rd, where the University of Iowa will talk to us about the benefits and the differences between coming at the undergraduate level versus staying um, in India or going somewhere, somewhere else for your bachelor's and then coming for graduate. So we'll kind of weigh, um, Adam Parker will help us weigh some of the um, benefits and the pros and cons of doing one over the other. Anna, thank you again for joining us, for talking a little bit about the elections and then also um, taking us through the Common App. It was very informative. And this will be, this recording will go out to everyone registered and will go up on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great evening, everyone, and a great day to you, Anna. Good night. Good night.